So for your assignment today, we are going to review and go over the answers to this quizzes practice that we did yesterday. Now, you won't necessarily have seen this in these particular order when you took this live, but the more important thing is that you understand the content. Some of these are definitions. Some of this is going to be new stuff or stuff that you're a little shaky on. So you can pause this as you need to. Um, what you should do is just pay attention, listen, and make sure you understand the concepts. First of all, a valence electron, that's just a definition. Those are electrons that are in the outermost energy level. Now, how many valence electrons are in, a, are in group one elements? Here's what we looked at with the periodic table, and we drew on this the other day. We said that all of these guys have one valence electron. Well, the group one valence electrons have, uh, group one elements have one valence electron. So what charge does the group one elements take? Well, if you have one valence electron, remember, you're trying to get eight or basically zero so that you're stable. So these elements over here, they're going to give up an electron because they can't possibly take seven to get eight. So they're going to give up one. When you give up an electron, you're giving up one negative charge means you're going to have one more positive charge than you have negative. So those group element, group one elements are going to end up having a plus one charge. How many valence electrons does group two have? Well, group two has two valence electrons. What ionic charge do, do they usually take? Well, if they have two valence electrons, they're not going to take six. They're going to give up two. So they're going to give up two negative charges, which means they're going to have two more positive charges than negative charges. They're going to have a plus two charge. Now, typically, how, much, how many valence electrons does an atom want? That's eight. That's that octet rule. And not every atom, not every element can get to eight by taking electrons. Sometimes they have to give up the outermost electrons so that then the next inside energy level has eight, and that's how they get to the octet rule. How many valence electrons does group 13 have? Well, look that this is one, this is two. Remember, all of these in here generally have two valence electrons. And here, when we start the S, or sorry, the P block, S1, S2, this is now P1, so you have two plus the one P electron. You have three valence electrons. You have four. You have five. You notice in the pattern, six, seven. And everything from neon down has eight. Helium obviously only has two. So how many valence electrons group 13 is three. What's going to be their charge? Well, they're still going to give up those three electrons to get to that octet rule. So they're going to have a plus three ionic charge. Now, the group 14, group 14, remember, has four. How many valence electrons do group four, uh, does group 15 have? Well, if 14 has four, group 15 then has five. Group 16 has six. Now, group 15 has five valence electrons. To get to eight, they're going to gain three electrons. Well, if you gain three electrons, you gain three negative charges, and your charge is going to be negative three. What charge does the group 16 have? Well, if they have six valence electrons, they're going to take two more to get the octet rule. It's going to be negative two charge. Group 17 has seven valence electrons. So what charge are they going to be when they become an ion? They're going to be negative one because they have to take one electron to get to be eight taking one electron, that's one negative charge, their charge is negative one. Group 18 has eight. They've already satisfied the octet rule. What ionic charge does group 18 have? 
zero because they already have satisfied the octet rule they're not going to give or take electrons they're just going to remain neutral they don't form ions because they don't give or take electrons because they've already satisfied the octet rule now an ionic compound this is when we have two ions we have something positive and something negative whatever they are and they're stuck together an atom that has a positive charge because it's given up electrons and another atom that or ion that has a negative charge because it took electrons well the positive and negative stick together that's an ionic compound the net charge is zero just like with atoms have to be zero compounds their net charge has to be zero because if the compound were a little bit more positive it's still going to attract more negatives if a compound was a little bit more negative it's going to still attract more positive so all ionic compounds have to have a net charge of zero what type of elements are needed to make an ionic compound and this is something miss campbell started to introduce to you yesterday that is a metal and a non-metal because the metals are the ones that are going to give electrons and the non-metals are the ones that are going to take and that's what it takes to make an ionic compound you got to have somebody who's giving up electrons becoming a positive ion and somebody who's taking electrons becoming a negative ion an ionic compound is when you have those positives and negatives that then stick together what types of ions are needed to make ionic compounds i just said that a cation and an anion well i i, I didn't use those words I was working on the assumption that you knew what a cation and an anion were. A cation is just simply an ion that's positive, and an anion is one that's negative. You can't have a compound with two positives because they don't stick together. You can't have a compound with two negatives. Two anions will not make a compound because two negatives won't stick together. What types of elements form cations? Those are going to be your metals because they give away electrons. So they have more positives. Then they have negatives. That's what a cation is. The opposite of that. Who's taking the electrons and becoming an anion? Those are going to be your nonmetals. What is the name of this thing here? Well, say the name of the first one is magnesium. Take the name of the second one, chlorine, and put IDE on it. So this is magnesium chloride. Some of you ask questions about what does this two mean? that's where we're going today but anytime you have one of these ionic compounds you just say the name of the first one change the name of the second one to ide what three letters do most binary ionic compounds end with i just told you the rule for the most part and we'll talk about some exceptions later but for the most part they end in ide let's name this guy well that's sodium and that's chlorine. So you change any of the second one to IDE, you got sodium chloride. This is potassium and oxygen, so it's potassium oxide. Here we've got aluminum and sulfur, so it's aluminum and sulfide. Here we've got barium and nitrogen. So we've got barium nitride. Here we've got barium and oxygen. So we've got barium oxide. Wait, didn't we already have this one? For some reason, this one got on there twice. This would be magnesium and chlorine, magnesium chloride. Now this one is potassium and chlorine so it's going to be potassium chloride here we've got aluminum chloride calcium and sulfur makes calcium sulfide lithium and oxygen lithium oxide now we're getting a little tricky and this wasn't what was introduced to you yesterday this was a hey wait a minute how do i know which one is which and that's the point of today's discussion 
if you look, this one is sodium and iodine, sodium and iodine, sodium and iodine. Which one is the correct formula for sodium iodide? Well, these little numbers down here, they're called subscripts because they're sub, they're below the line. Subscripts tell how many of each atom. So in, in this sodium, we have one and one because there's no, we don't write ones. There's one sodium, one iodine. In this one, there's two sodiums and one iodine. That's not even right. Two sodiums and two iodides. So how do I know what the right number is? Well, now we got to go back to our periodic table and say, what do we know about these guys? Well, we know sodium has one valence electron. He really wants to get rid of that one valence electron. Iodine over here has seven valence electrons. So let me draw a dot diagram for you. Here's sodium. Here's iodine. Remember, they're both trying to get to either eight or zero valence electrons. So these two guys bump into each other on the street. And this guy is saying, hey, I got a spare electron. Would you mind taking my electron? And iodine says, I would love to take your electron because I don't need one more. I have now satisfied the octet rule. Hey, I've got zero. I have now satisfied the octet rule. Now, how many sodiums and how many iodines did it take for everybody to be happy? Well, it only took one sodium and one iodine. It worked out. So my formula is that. Now, why do these guys stay together? Because now this guy gives up the electron, becomes positive. This guy took an electron negative. They stick together because of opposite charges. How many of each one did it take for everybody to satisfy the octet rule? One sodium, one iodine. So the formula is one sodium and one iodine. Now, on the other hand, magnesium fluoride. Magnesium has two valence electrons. Fluorine has seven. And so magnesium's walking down the street and bumps into fluorine and fluorine's like, hey man, I would really like to have an electron because if I get one more electron, I satisfy the octet rule. Magnesium's like, sure, whatever. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of two electrons anyway. Let me give you that electron. And now fluorine is a happy fluorine. He has satisfied the octet rule, but magnesium has not. Magnesium still got another electron to get rid of. And he, he turns to fluorine and says, yo, dude, hey, come on, help me out here. Take the other electron. And fluorine's like, no way, because I, I've got eight and that's what, that's my goal. I've met my goal. I don't need your other electron. But out there in the real world, there isn't just one atom at a time sitting there. Florian's got a twin brother who happens to be walking down the street with him. Now you see what's going to happen. This Florian's like, hey, where'd you get that electron? Oh, I got it from my buddy Magnesium over here. Yo, dude, can you help me out? I'm, I, I could really use an electron too. And Magnesium's like, you're in luck. I got another electron to give. Now, this fluorine's happy, satisfied the octet rule. This magnesium is happy, satisfied the octet rule. Now look at the combination. How many magnesiums and how many fluorines did it take for everybody to satisfy the octet rule? It took one magnesium and two fluorines to make everybody happy, to make everybody satisfy the octet rule. And the way you write that, if there's no subscript, it's just understood to be one. But in this case, we got to have a way to show that we had two fluorines. That's how we write it. So the correct formula there would be magnesium fluoride. Okay. Ooh, gallium and oxygen. Oh, man. Gallium has three valence electrons. Oxygen has six.
look at the pattern here. Gallium says, hey, you can take two of my electrons, can't you? Oxygen is happy to do so. Oxygen is happy. Gallium still got another electron out there, though. Okay, so oxygen's twin brother comes along. Gallium says, hey, would you take my electron? Oxygen's like, sure, I'm looking to take electrons. But it doesn't have enough. It's still missing one. This doesn't work. This doesn't make a compound because not everybody has satisfied the octet rule. But let's say gallium's twin brother is there. Now this gallium still got two more electrons to get rid of. So instead of the oxygen twins, we've got the oxygen triplets. Now, everybody's happy. We got two galliums that were able to give away all their electrons, and it took three oxygens to make the pairing work. So this is a compound where you need two galliums and three oxygens to satisfy the octet rule. So two galliums and three oxygens. Okay. Now, we're not necessarily going to go through every single one of these drawn dot diagrams. This gets a this gets a little crazy. And we can't do this every single time. And there is a little trick to it that I'm going to show you right now. Let's look at calcium and nitrogen. So calcium has two valence electrons. Nitrogen has five. And I'll just go through this process one more time. All right, so calcium's good, but nitrogen is not. Another calcium. So nitrogen is good. Now this calcium's got one more left over. So this is the combination that made it work. We had, how many calcium? One, two, three calciums and two nitrogens. Oh, I didn't realize that was off the screen. Now, there's an easier way to do this than what I just did. Here is calcium. Notice that calcium has two valence electrons. It wants to give up two valence electrons, but become a plus two cation. Nitrogen has three valence electrons, sorry, five valence electrons. It wants to take three and become a negative three anion based on the number of valence electrons it has. Wait, we got a, we got a two and we got a three. As it turns out, I can look at the periodic table and get these numbers and not have to draw a bunch of dot diagrams. Calcium wants to be a plus two cation. Nitrogen wants to be a negative three anion. This is a little trick that we're going to call drop cross and we'll do reduce later. If I take that number down there, Take that number from calcium and drop it down here. Notice what I get. I get the same thing that I got by drawing all the dots. So this is our little shortcut. If we can tell what kind of charge it wants to have by giving or taking electrons, we can do a little switch like this, and it'll tell me how many of each atom it takes to make everybody satisfy the octet rule. And we'll do this a couple more times with dot diagrams. And after, afterwards, we'll just kind of accept that, okay, I get it. That's the way it works. All right. Beryllium oxide. We know it's beryllium and oxygen. Beryllium is a plus two. Oxygen is a minus two.
So we cross and drop these. We're going to get Be2, O2. Remember, these are like ratios. These are fractions. These are two beryllium's for every one oxygen. So if we had a ratio of two to two, would your math teacher accept that? Answer is no. You reduce ratios into their lowest common uh, factors or lowest common relationship. So we don't if these if these numbers are the same, we don't say two to two. We say just one to one. We reduce the ratio just like we would reduce a fraction. And that's my formula. And if we drew it out, we would get it. Here's beryllium with a two. We see how it's it, that's easy. It just takes one for every one to make the octet rule happen. Calcium fluoride. Calcium wants to be plus two. Fluorine's a minus one. We drop and cross. C A F two. Sodium phosphide. Sodium is going to be a plus one. Phosphorus is going to be a negative three. Drop and cross, we get NaP3. Aluminum nitride. Aluminum is a plus three. Nitrogen is a minus three. So we think we get that, but remember, these are ratios, reduce them just like you reduce fractions. Aluminum nitride. That really, oh, well, sorry, that's a capital L. Okay. Strontium plus two. Chlorides minus one, drop and cross, SRCL. Two. And finally, sodium chloride. Sodium is a plus one cation. Chlorine is going to be a negative one cation. You get NaCl. So tomorrow, Miss Campbell will come in and go over this. Um, drop, cross, and reduce a little bit more for you and with you before we give you your next set of practice problems. And in that case, uh, in that the, those problems, you're going to be writing the formulas from the name or just being given two atoms on the periodic table. How do you write the chemical formula and say the name?